Um, so my name is Vincent Taylor. I'm the Chamber International's Customs Manager. And I joined them in April this year. And uh, there's someone else just coming in, Lorraine. Thank you very much. And uh, we go about our business with the Western North Yorkshire Chamber of Commerce. And this uh, particular area of operations is uh, to do with the Chamber's Trade Academy, uh, in which we hope to put some bite-sized elements to uh, to the people that come in to these episodes. It's free. And um, I've been chosen from a cast of thousands to do a quick guide to US export controls. I'm really aiming it at specifically for the UK businesses who might not be aware of the intricacies of buying and sourcing US goods. Um, at the end of the episode, if you like, Lana coming in. Um, at the end of all this, uh, we'll do a quick Q&A just to see if there's anything out there that we can add to this or, or in, inject into our business sense. So that's the, what's the, all about. So about the Chambers Trade Academy, uh, you're probably all aware of it anyway, but just to say um, it's an initiative, selected chambers, and we've got a few on, in this particular session. Um, welcome everybody uh, and we go across the uk with the chambers of commerce to provide this free short virtual sessions as i said it's supposed to be informative and educational and regarding exporting and importing in particular we cover from the basics of trading to customs processes and the latest regulations and tips grow globally and i think these are going to be put together in different subject matter areas by different presenters. So I think it's a really good thing that the BCC uh, generally are, are putting together. Uh, combined, we present more than 15,000 businesses of all sizes and sectors across the UK. And um, we're concentrating at the moment with people that are probably unaware of the most of the regulations, um, the small and medium enterprises that have got little um bandwidth to be able to wear the only hat to export and import and customs activities so the person responsible for customs might be wearing two or three hats so what do we do with sport traders of these all sizes as i say and um every stage of the internationalization journey and the bullet point says it all that we we cover everything from international trade events, the readiness assessments of those who want to get their compliance effort up and running in any type of compliance that works with the customs activities enforced by HMRC, of course. And the export, import and customs training courses that we all run uh, in our own uh, ballywick, so to speak. Um, Apart from our partner finding services, we have commercial debt recovery, foreign exchange services, letters of credit, credit checks, certification, custom brokerage services, and post-Brexit information support. So I think most people are aware of that. I do have someone in the chat. What's going on? Um, okay, what's that? Uh, well, I'd love to connect with you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll do that. No worries. I'll have a look at that in uh, a little bit there. Thank you. Um, so, um, what's my uh, play in all this? My defence background, I'm 28 years in the Royal Navy, so I served uh, Majesty the Queen at the time and uh, then moved out into being headhunted to firms like the French firm Thales, for example. I uh, worked for them and then I really did cut my teeth in the American controls, uh, working for Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. So that's my provenance behind uh, what I think I know about all this stuff. Uh, around about 2013, Mr. Obama, the president at the time, decided to conduct an export control reform. And so uh, we're gonna work on the quick guide to US export controls um, because you may have a business that has indigenous IP, intellectual property, that uh, wants to be protected. And unwittingly, if you buy something from the United States and it 
co-mingles itself into your machine or your design. You could be uh, tainting that design by a virus. And if it's military, it would be, we term it the ITAR virus. And if it's uh, dual use, which is those controls where they're not on the military design line, but they are uh, designed for commercial use primarily, but they can be adapted, then also the US export controls could have a play in your business for re-exports, retransfers. So we need to be aware of this at business levels. So what are the US export controls and who governs them? Well, unlike the uh, UK, who have a single regime, as it's a legislative um, regime, the ECJU that govern the licenses and HMRC enforce the, uh, the, the police, if you like, for the customs activities that work with export controls. The American system, I just want to close this down slightly, um, how, you need to get use of the vernacular. Um, we all hear on the television the words hood, which means bonnet. Um, faucet means tap. Uh, mu munitions means military. And uh, technical data is a technology. So technology that we call controlled technology would be tech data to our American friends across the pond. So you would spell this, uh, get used to the spelling of the word defense with an S. So first of all, we look at the Export Administration Regulations, the EAR. I think I remember going to a couple of uh, courses and I always thought it was in a medical conference at one point because one was ITAR and the other one was EAR. I didn't realize what I was getting into. Now, EAR means the Export Administration Regulations. It's the dual use side of that is administered by the Bureau of Industry and Security. At one point in time, the DTI, who I used to work for um, in the control organization, the basically the EAR primarily controls those dual use items, which I explained were those goods and technologies and software uh, that have both civilian and military application. It's a good point to note that in the American system, whereas we have two different um, sets called technology and another one called software, um, all detailed in our strategic listings, the Americans bundle it together as technical data. So you may be buying software and technology uh, when it's called technical data. But in this case, for the EAR, they both have civilian and military applications. So they could be wanted by people that can't get it in the, in the, uh, the current climate. For example, Mr. Putin might want to buy something for his WMD that he can't get hold of at the moment, and he's willing to buy anything that can actually be equivalent. And it's dual use. And we find now in the tariff, in the UK tariff, that dual use is more concentrated now since Brexit. Um, when we look up an HS code, you will find the export tab uh, pointing the way towards a compliance feature that might say conditions, this is dual use, get a license. And it's throwing people, uh, A, because they're not aware of that export tab or, or if it exists, and B, because they have no clue on how to understand if it is going to be uh, controlled and how would they know anyway. So we're going out to our clients at the uh, Chamber International and we're finding this void and we're basically trying to put them right on the compliance angle. Um, anyhow, we can, it can choose electronics and software and chemicals and materials. And those are more familiar with the export control Act of 2002 and the Vassanar list, which it all stems from, dual use controls are worldly uh, mirrored all over uh, these control areas. But the Americans actually use a different way of doing it, although they do conduct the same um, nomenclature of ECCNs, which are the export control classification numbers. There's that, that acronym. Uh, and it's based on their sensitivity and potential for harm, of course, but 
everything in America will sit on the EAR list. And it could be as something simple uh, as some paperwork or something else that will sit at the bottom of the list. And they do that to aim to catch everything. And the reason they catch it will be more um, come clear when we look at a little bit deeper into this one. So that's the Department of Commerce. So we've got the, that's the first regulatory body. And oh, where's that gone? There it is. There it is. The second one and the most important one really is for those working with military controls, fence systems. Um, defense systems, these are administered by the Director of Defense Trade Controls and uh, shortened to DDTC. And under the US Department of State, there are many um, references of Code of Federal Regulations that basically states the, the rules, rights and privileges of every exporter from the United States and woe betide anyone that doesn't uh, follow those. Um, and so um, what we're looking at in ITAR, um, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, is the export of those defence, and note that spelling again, defence articles, um, services and technical data. So what do you get when you actually interact with these particular controls? Um, you get a licence, which is like a non-disclosure agreement. It's like a contract. It's pages and pages long. And it runs through the Department of State and all the community of approvers. And it can take three to six months. I once had a, uh, a technical assistance agreement, which is what they're called, and that took 12 months to put together. So unlike the UK, where you're asking for a license, which can take six weeks, these American licenses can take a long time. Hence, the planning of them has to be well thought of because they include weapons, ammunition, military hardware and related technical information. So for those businesses that are not injecting ITAR into their machines and their intellectual property, you're fine. Keep out of that. For those businesses that are purely making uh, commercial goods, be aware of the export administration regulations. And what you should be looking at really is when you buy something at the bottom, probably in the small print of an invoice, it will carry what is called a destination control statement. And if it says something like, yea, verily, these are sourced from the United States and shall not be lent, leased, or transferred without the permission, XXX, then that's called a destination control statement. And you need to be wary of that. And we have uh, rules, rights, and uh, statements that we can actually use to protect that when they do get retransferred. The types of controlled items under US governance, why are they important? Okay, all right, so let's have a look. National security, we do the same thing by the way, we have eight criterion that we follow before a license will be applied. And as I said, I did work for the DTI 2004, five and six, and I, I was a, uh, a licensing officer working with the Ministry of Defense. So I was part of the export control approval community, looking at every seal and open, in, open individual export license that came across our desks. In them days, it was mostly paper. Today, it's all digital, and there is an account called Spire, which a business can actually use to get those licenses in play. In the USA, they have a set of tools that uh, businesses will use in order to do the same thing. And then it goes into their community. And the first thing they'll look at always, always is the national security of the United States, safeguarding those interests on preventative, sensitive technology from falling into the wrong hands. And that means anybody that the Americans aren't getting on with at the moment. So the UK companies dealing with controlled items must ensure they aren't inadvertently contributing, contributing to the security risks um, May 2019, the US Department is an example of, of a Commerce uh, Act. It added Huawei and its affiliates to the intent entity list. And at the time, I was working for Vodafone in this case, whereby the telecoms industry was obviously working with Huawei for the 5G network. It caused chaos. 
And as such, uh, everything started to become a US problem. Uh, and in the end, Huawei was removed from the, uh, the business model. So national security, mitigating any risks, um, adhering to US controls, export controls, minimizing risks of unwitting supporting illegal activities that entities that pose security risk. Um, and this, the sort of thing you've got here, the bloke in handcuffs, uh, on the 13th of January, the High Court ruled that Christopher Tappin, a UK national, could be extradited to the US to face charges relating to alleged breaches of US export controls. What he was doing was sending large batteries uh, as a freight forwarder to Iran. And there's the kind of thing that you would uh, not want to get into. So it does happen. Uh, other things we might want to look at is preserving the technological edge. Well, everyone knows that most of the best stuff does come from uh, the US and controlled items often include cutting edge technologies. And UK companies must respect the export controls to maintain the US competitive advantages and the technological leadership. This is where their words, not mine. And complying with export controls demonstrates an ethical business practice uh, so commitment to security and responsible international engagement. And of course, the legal compliance is UK companies exporting or re-exporting control items of US origin must comply with the US export regs. They do have an extraterritorial reach, as you saw in the Chris Tappin one, um, that they can go to the High Court and get people over there to, to take trial. So to avoid the legal consequences, penalties and the reputational damage, it's important that we get that message out there to the businesses and the businesses understand what they're getting into. And they do, in fact, buy the best technologies and also those that are controlled. Preventing proliferation, of course, uh, especially dual use of controlled items and technologies that could be misused for malicious purposes. And UK companies play a role in preventing unauthorised proliferation of sensitive technology, especially to prevent weapons of mass dis destruction or military end use enhancements. Um, so my name is Vincent Taylor. I'm the Chamber International's Customs Manager. And I joined them in April this year. And uh, someone else just coming in, Lorraine, thank you very much. And uh, we go about our business with the Western North Yorkshire Chamber of Commerce. And this uh, particular area of operations is uh, to do with the Chambers Trade Academy, uh, in which we hope to put some bite-sized elements to uh, to the people that come in to these episodes. It's free. And um, I've been chosen from a cast of thousands <laughs> to do a quick guide to US export controls. And I'm really aiming it at specifically for the UK businesses who might not be aware of the intricacies of buying and sourcing US goods. Um, at the end of the episode, if you like, Lana coming in, um, at the end of all this, uh, we'll do a quick Q&A just to see if there's anything out there that we can add to this or, or in, inject into our business sense. So uh, that's what's the all about. So about the Chambers Trade Academy, and you're probably all aware of it anyway, but just to say um, it's an initiative, selected chambers, and we've got a few on, in this particular session. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, and we go across the UK with the Chambers of Commerce to provide this free short virtual sessions. As I said, it's supposed to be informative and educational and regarding exporting and importing in particular. We cover from the basics of trading to customs processes and the latest regulations and tips grow globally. And I think these are going to be put together in different subject matter areas by different presenters. So I think it's a really good thing that the BCC uh, generally are, are putting together. Uh, combined, we present more than 15,000 businesses of all sizes and sectors across the UK. And um, we're concentrating at the moment with people that are probably unaware of the most of the regulations, um, the small and medium enterprises that have got little um, bandwidth to be able to 
where they only had to export and import and customs activities. So the person responsible for customs might be wearing two or three hats. So what do we do with sport traders of these all sizes, as I say, and um, every stage of the internationalization journey? And the bullet point says it all that we we cover everything from international trade events, the readiness assessments of those who want to get their compliance effort up and running in any type of compliance that works with the customs activities enforced by HMRC, of course. And the export, import and customs training courses that we all run uh, in our own uh, ballywick, so to speak, um, is very, very good. Uh, and competitive with others of that kind of uh, existence that's out there on the market. And we provide a bespoke advice and customs consultancy service and market identification service and market research and entry services as well. And so we've got another one coming in, Mark. And uh, apart from our partner finding services, we have commercial debt recovery, foreign exchange services, letters of credit, credit checks, certification, customs brokerage services, and post-Brexit information support. So I think most people are aware of that. I do have someone in the chat. What's going on? Um, okay, what's that? Uh, well, I'd love to connect with you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll do that. No worries. I'll have a look at that in uh, a little bit about Thank you. Um, so um, what's my uh, play in all this? My defence background of 28 years in the Royal Navy. So I served uh, Majesty the Queen at the time and uh, then moved out into being headhunted to firms like the French firm Thales, for example. Uh, worked for them and then I really did cut my teeth in the American controls, uh, working for Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. So that's my provenance behind uh, what I think I know about all this stuff. Uh, around about 2013, Mr. Obama, the president at the time, decided to conduct an export control reform. And so uh, we're going to work on the quick guide to US export controls um, because you may have a business that has indigenous IP, intellectual property, that uh, wants to be protected and unwittingly. If you buy something from the United States and it commingles itself into your machine or your design, you could be uh, tainting that design by a virus. And if it's military, it would be, we term it the ITAR virus. And if it's uh, dual use, which is those controls where they're not on the military design line, but they are uh, designed for commercial use primarily, but they can be adapted, then also the US export controls could have a play in your business for re-exports, re-transfers. So we need to be aware of this at business levels. So what are the US export controls and who governs them? Well, unlike the uh, UK who have a single regime, as it's a legislative um, regime, the ECJU that govern the licenses and HMRC enforce the, uh, the police, if you like, for the customs activities that work with export controls. The American system, I just want to close this down slightly, um, how, you need to get use of the vernacular. Um, we all hear on the television the words hood, which means bonnet, um, force it means tap, uh, munitions means military, and uh, technical data is a technology. So technology that we call controlled technology would be tech data to our American friends across the pond. So you would spell this, uh, get used to the spelling of the word defense with an S. So first of all, we look at the Export Administration Regulations, the EAR. I think I remember going to a couple of uh, courses and I always thought it was in a medical conference at one point because one was ITAR and the other one was EAR. I didn't realise what I was getting into. 
Now, EAR means the Export Administration Regulations. It's the dual use side of that and it's administered by the Bureau of Industry and Security. At one point in time, the DTI, who I used to work for um, in the export control organization, uh, got someone else coming in, two sacks. Thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dave. <laughs> Late, but never mind. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, the basically the EAR primarily controls those dual use items, which I explained were those goods and technologies and software uh, that have both civilian and military application. It's a good point to note that in the American system, whereas we have two different um, sets called technology and another one called software, um, all detailed in our strategic listings, the Americans bundle it together as technical data. So you may be buying software and technology uh, when it's called technical data. But in this case, for the EAR, they both have civilian and military applications. So they could be wanted by people that can't get it in the, in the, uh, the current climate. For example, Mr. Putin might want to buy something for his WMD that he can't get hold of at the moment, and he's willing to buy anything that can actually be equivalent. And it's dual use. And we find now in the tariff, in the UK tariff, that dual use is more concentrated now since Brexit. Um, when we look up an HS code, you will find the export tab uh, pointing the way towards a compliance feature that might say conditions, this is dual use, get a license. And it's throwing people, uh, A, because they're not aware of that export tab or, or if it exists, and B, because they have no clue on how to understand if it is going to be uh, controlled and how would they know anyway. So we're going out to our clients at the uh, Chamber International and we're finding this void and we're basically trying to put them right on the compliance angle. Um, now in the EAR, this way, another person coming in. Um, in the EAR, we can, it can choose electronics and software and chemicals and materials. And those are more familiar with the Export Control Act of 2002 and the Vassanar list, which it all stems from. Dual use controls are worldly uh, mirrored all over uh, these control areas. But the Americans actually use a different way of doing it, although they do conduct the same um, nomenclature of ECCNs, which are the Export Control Classification Numbers, there's that, that uh, acronym. Uh, and it's based on their sensitivity and potential for harm, of course, but everything in America will sit on the EAR list. And it could be as something simple uh, as some paperwork or something else that will sit at the bottom of the list. And they do that to aim to catch everything and the reason they catch it will be more um, come clear when we look at a little bit deeper into this one. But that's the Department of Commerce. So we've got the, that's the first regulatory body. And oh, where's that gone? There it is. There it is. The second one and the most important one really is for those working with military controls, fence systems. Welcome, Matthew. Um, defense systems, these are administered by the Director of Defense Trade Controls and uh, shortened to DDTC. And under the US Department of State, there are many um, references of Code of Federal Regulations that basically states the, the rules, rights, and privileges of every exporter from the United States and woe betide anyone that doesn't uh, follow those. Hello, Matthew, would you like to mute yourself? Sorry, I beg your pardon. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and so um, what we're looking at in ITAR, um, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, is the export of those defence, and note that spelling again, defence articles, um, services and technical data. So what do you get when you actually interact with these particular controls? Um, you get a license, which is like a non-disclosure agreement. It's like a contract. It's pages and pages long, 
and it runs through the Department of State and all the community of approvers. And it can take three to six months. I once had a, uh, a technical assistance agreement, which is what they're called, and that took 12 months to put together. So unlike the UK, where you're asking for a license, which can take six weeks, these American licenses can take a long time. Hence, the planning of them has to be well thought of because they include weapons, ammunition, military hardware and related technical information. So for those businesses that are not injecting ITAR into their machines and their intellectual property, you're fine. Keep out of that. For those businesses that are purely making uh, commercial goods, be aware of the export administration regulations. And what you should be looking at really is when you buy something at the bottom, probably in the small print of an invoice, it will carry what is called a destination control statement. And if it says something like, yea, verily, these are sourced from the United States and shall not be lent, leased or transferred without the permission, XXX, then that's called a destination control statement. And you need to be wary of that. And we have uh, rules, rights and uh, statements that we can actually use to protect that when they do get retransferred. The types of controlled items under US governance, why are they important? Okay. All right. So let's have a look. National security. We do the same thing, by the way. We have eight criterion that we follow before a license will be applied. And as I said, I did work for the DTI in 2004, five and six, and I, I was a, uh, a licensing officer working with the Ministry of Defense. So I was part of the export control approval community, looking at every seal and open, in, open individual export license that came across our desks. In them days, it was mostly paper. Today, it's all digital, and there is an account called Spire, which a business can actually use to get those licenses in play. In the USA, they have a set of tools that uh, businesses will use in order to do the same thing. And then it goes into their community. And the first thing they'll look at always, always is the national security of the United States, safeguarding those interests on preventive, sensitive technology from falling into the wrong hands. And that means anybody that the Americans aren't getting on with at the moment. So the UK companies dealing with controlled items must ensure they aren't inadvertently contributing, contributing to the security risks. Um, May 2019, the US Department is an example of, of a commerce uh, act. It added Huawei and its affiliates to the intent entity list. At the time, I was working for Vodafone in this case, whereby the telecoms industry was obviously working with Huawei for the 5G network. It caused chaos. And as such, uh, everything started to become a US problem. Uh, and in the end, Huawei was removed from the, uh, the business model. So national security, mitigating any risks, um, adhering to US controls, export controls, minimizing risks of unwitting supporting illegal activities that entities that pose security risk. Um, and this, the sort of thing you've got here, the bloke in handcuffs, uh, on the 13th of January, the High Court ruled that Christopher Tappin, a UK national, could be extradited to the US to face charges relating to alleged breaches of US export controls. What he was doing was sending large batteries uh, as a freight forwarder to Iran. And there's the kind of thing that you would uh, not want to get into. So it does happen. Uh, other things we might want to look at is preserving the technological edge. Well, everyone knows that most of the best stuff does come from uh, the US. And controlled items often include cutting edge technologies and UK companies must respect the export controls to maintain the US competitive advantages and the technological leadership. This is where their words, not mine. And complying with export controls demonstrates an ethical business practice as uh, so a commitment to security and responsible international engagement. And of course, the legal compliance is. UK companies exporting or re-exporting control items of US origin must comply with the US export regs. They do have an extraterritorial reach, as you saw in the Chris Tappin one, 
um, that they can go to the High Court and get people over there to, to take trial. So to avoid the legal consequences, penalties and the reputational damage, it's important that we get that message out there to the businesses and the businesses understand what they're getting into. And they do, in fact, buy the best technologies and also those that are controlled. Preventing proliferation, of course, uh, especially dual use of controlled items and technologies that could be misused for malicious purposes. And UK companies play a role in preventing unauthorised proliferation of sensitive technology, especially to prevent weapons of mass dis destruction or military end use enhancements. Global trade uh, partnerships, let's move on. The global trade partnerships, nice little motive on the other side there between Russia and the Americans, uh, obviously helping our good friend in Ukraine uh, and trying to stem the uh, possible dictatorship of this man on the top of it. Uh, but the global trade partnerships, the US, UK and the US share close trade relationships. And um, with understanding and adhering to US export controls enhances the trust and facilitates smoother trade between the two nations. So that special relationship does exist in the sorts. Uh, so then basically the US has had the uh, super policeman urge its international al allies, particularly those in what we call the Five Eyes. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but the Five Eyes is Intelligence Sharing Alliance and all documents that are marked as uh, secret and above uh, are allowed to be seen by Australia, Canada, New Zealand and UK, sometimes given the acronym OSCANUCAS, uh, USCA in New Zealand, UK, Canada, uh, to restrict Huawei's involvement in their 5G networks, perhaps due to security concerns. That was uh, a major uh, share. So US controls brought into play under contractual obligations through commingling, retransfers and re-exports. This word commingling is a unique word that keeps coming up at the moment. And let's have a look and see what we're doing here. So on the right there, my little brains, um, US terms number two, retransfer, re-export controls, deemed exports, and the other guys saying TAAs, technical assistance agreements, DSPs, Department of State Performers, number 61, DSP, Department of State Performer, number five, dual national controls, third country national controls. All these are needed to be thought about if you're going to be working with American technologies. And in the maps, to a, you can go uh, to a third party in the same country, which can include a subcontractor for a different end use. And what's playing here is the fact that you are maybe transferring from the thing that you received in the UK to France. So France is a territory and the only territory where it can go. But if you're the French company that you basically got some goods coming in and you give it to your subcontractor and customer, that's called a retransfer. So in the first case map, you're it's an export. And in the second case map, it's a retransfer. We don't use these terms in the UK. We export goods and they go to an end user, the end user destination. And then those goods can be lost their identity into the new machine or into the products that they ordered. But the Americans have this thing called retransfer. Not only that, they can have the play game called third country or dual national employees. Now, if there's an employee in that French company that might be of a different uh, nationality, and remember that the four freedoms of the United, uh, EU, uh, freedom of movement of people, you can get people working from other countries in France that are not necessarily uh, a permanent um, born resident of that, of that country. So they're called third country nationals because they work in France, but they're actually hail from another country. So in the bottom map, you've got these flags where you've got to keep looking to see whether or not you are unwittingly retransferring tech data or goods to uh, end users. And if they are, the territory of the license that you uh, deploy from the United States uh, exporter has to be factored into that license. So you're not going to be stepping into danger. 
So that's the obligations uh, through commingling and, and retransfers. If we look a little bit more at commingling, um, what does this actually mean? It's actually um, it's in the mixing of controlled items with non-controlled items. I say, so um, I, I take this an analogy. I make a tin bucket and I put in the tin bucket um, some goods. Yeah, so it's made out of tin, but I then make that bucket uh, a little bit more savvy in as much that it now contains an American component, which controls the flow of water out of the bucket and allows it to work in a fashion with a water company, for example. Um, so um, they've commingled something that I bought from America into an in innocent little thing, but let's take it on the larger scale. If you've got uh, a company that makes a sizable rocket and it's all made in the UK, but one of the components is ITAR, because it needs to work with the rocket, and it, but for the fact of that part, it won't it won't work. Then it's commingled into the rocket. Now, if the rocket was being sold to a defense company in another country, um, then the piece inside of it needs to be licensed to that country as well as the license that you get from the UK, and that's commingling. There's another thing that's not mentioned here is a Latin term called de minimis. And de minimis really means that it's a product of the goods. So let's say if I sold that tin bucket for um, 500 pounds, but then I added the, the part into it, which cost me yeah, 250 pounds, then the that would contain 50% uh, of the cost of the sale of that item. If items go over 25%, uh, then it's allowed to go mostly, uh, if it goes under 25%, it's going to go mostly everywhere. But if it goes over 50%, then it might need to go back to the United States and ask the person that gave you that component um, to get you a license if you want to resell that bucket across the, the world. Why is that really little thing that I call a bucket? But you know what I mean, it's something that could be intellectual property of some kind that you've made and designed indigenously in the UK and unwittingly you've just put a content of the product in the United States ilk into that, uh, that machine. That's called commingling. Compliance and penalties. Now we do have compliance and penalties in the UK and they can be extreme. Uh, those of you uh, are actually quite au fait with export controls and notices to exporters, that's worth signing up for. And you can do that through the internet um, for the United Kingdom's uh, way of telling you there are people out there that are being fined. Uh, compound penalties are happening all the time. But what's happening in the States is um, you're getting this US nexus coming into to play something wicked this way comes. Um, it's called the see-through rule, and it's like the rocket I was saying to you. There's a guy at the bottom of the screen, you know, and he's, he's gone to his purchasing department and his techie and everything else and said, okay, this is what we're going to export, but who put that US part in it? That's called the Americans' uh, way of looking through the whole machine and saying, we own that. So you've got to be careful that when you've made something and put a lot of work into business, uh, into the design of a product, that you're not unwittingly allowing American control of it at all. Um, I had an occasion working for a, um, a robotic firm and uh, they had made a lot of progress with different uh, firms taking over the business over the years in the design of an IED pickup um, that's a amplifiers explosive device pickup machine and basically it was going to be sold to the MOD 95 of these items at some point in around about the early 2004 or 5 uh, one of the American companies um, took over and acquired the firm and basically sent over engineers to enhance the detail of the IED collector 
and all the indigenous IP that was the most worthy of old from their old design engineers was now tainted by the ITAR virus. And that US nexus is, is the most severe thing that you can get because now it's an ITAR item which the MOD were not expecting when they signed the contract. So that gives you an idea of what's going on. But on the left-hand side, um, what it's showing there is the extraterritorial reach of the United States. It has the reach and they have a lantern program. That's a lantern, the blue lantern program, which investigates whether or not goods uh, are going out unwittingly and without a license. So they do look into um, the most technical and um, protected items that could get exported. So you're being watched. Um, so looking at past penalties, you can see in this screen shot um, civil penalties in the Department of Commerce on the EAR fines up to $250,000 per violation or twice the amount of the transaction, the suspension or debarment from government contracts and the revocation of export privileges. And in the criminal penalties, willful violation, there are fines of $1 million per violation, up to 20 years imprisonment. This is happening all the time. The thing about the EAR is where the most fines are occurring. The dual use controls are the things that catching people out. So it's mainly those fines going to go back to the US exporter who made the, um, the first export of the goods. Uh, and then a voluntary disclosure will come up from somebody who's made a mistake it could be down the line in the UK or somewhere else, um, but they've been honest and they've said, look, we've done something wrong here. And then they have to voluntarily disclose into the Department of Commerce. Similarly, in the Department of State, the fines of up to £500,000 uh, per violation and suspension or debarment again and seizure and forfeiture of the article, revocation of export privileges. Um, fines of up to one million per violation, up to 10 years imprisonment and debarment. You can see there that the EAR is far superior to the ITAR. <laughs> um, Department of the Treasury, the OFAC, uh, Office of Accreditation uh, uh, there, fines up to 250,000 per violation, suspension or debarment from government contracts. Again, same thing. So let's have a quick couple of examples. Um, the Intel subsidiary agrees to the 750,000 penalty unauthorized encryption exports. And on the right, in March 28, 2007, the biggest fine ever, ITT made these night vision goggles and they pleaded guilty to criminal charges of illegally exporting those vision goggles and the technology, omitting material facts and statements of the government. And it was a transfer of technology to a company in Singapore who employed Chinese nationals will be and characterized as an illegal export to China. Okay, so uh, it's $100 million, a lot of money to be uh, getting their compliance wrong. Okay, so this little bite-sized chunks of uh, data has looked at um, the commerce control list. Uh, where the EAR controls dual-use products, as I said, and we looked at the reasons, uh, the national security, where everything appears on a unique EAR catch-all listings. Incidentally, the bottom of the list have a number that no one really understands. It's called EAR 99, um, and it really means that it's not licensable in most cases, except to the countries which are prohibited from the United States, and that includes Cuba. Um, so it, the, the usual suspects, Iran, Iraq, uh, and uh, Russia, and all the rest of them that are currently in sanctions land. Um, so the catch-all there, but you must understand that some of the ECCNs in the dual, in the dual use list of uh, the United States don't marry up with the UK and the EU and the rest of the Vassanar list. They make them up to suit their uh, their interest of protection and then 
you are going to ha have to ask your OEM, the um, original engineering manufacturer, uh, which is a good thing to do. Uh, what's the ECCN of these ECCN of these goods I bought? If they don't know, it's a little bit uh, of a red flag because they should know. <laughs> so if they exported it, they would have had to go through all this, uh, these regulatory uh, elements. ITAR, uh, munitions and defense. Uh, once an ITAR item, always an ITAR item, commonly nicknamed the ITAR virus. And once your indigenous homemade designs are touched by it, a USMR article, um, be prepared for re-export controls with transfer exigencies and technical data controls to be placed in your contract or relationships. There's a couple of things here with uh, ITAR 120.1 um, and a good source of information, which I'll show you in a minute if I can, um, by screen sharing, I'll show you that there's an electronic code of federal regulations where you can look all this stuff up. Um, it's an interesting source. It's now been made electronic. So I think that's quite a worthwhile uh, area of ops to, to have in your Bible. Uh, ITAR 21 is uh, everything is defined, everything from a defense article to a foreign person. So you want to know what technical data is, go to this article of the US ITAR. You'll also see this symbol, ITAR with a sort of double S symbol. Um, as everything is defined here from the defense article, again, to the front person, you'll see this symbol saying symbol 120.1, and that's what it means. Themed exports. Oh, uh, what's going on here? Oh, what's that? I don't know what that is. No, we'll go back. What's going on there? What's that? It's not. We'll go back. <laughs> um, oh, dear, it's picking up my voice. Uh, right. Deemed exports, everything is defined here from a defense article. I think it's the same thing. Um, but what we're looking at there in deemed exports is um, an example would be if technical data is controlled and you leave a chart on your wall and the foreign employed cleaner comes in uh, to your office and can see that chart, um, it's equivalent of spying. So therefore, you have unwittingly made an export to the remaining cleaner or whoever they are. Um, and as such, if you're found to have done that, you will be charged under these acts. That's called deemed exports. The UK doesn't do that. Uh, we don't deploy those kind of uh, tactics. DN and TCN. Uh, the US lo looks at people where they're born. Uh, it's a little bit against human rights, as people might, might say, but over the years they have uh, eased springs slightly on this uh, and they've come up with a few rules that have allowed um, the businesses to be more um, yeah, employable of, of people coming from other countries, which is a good thing. But they still do have dual nationalities, DNs and third country nationals who will have to sign some kind of formal NDA in order to get the same access that the um, source country that's been imported has got the US goods. 126.1 pertains to the prohibition on exports, imports and sales to certain countries. And this section of ITAR lists countries that are subject to those restrictions, embargoes, limitations due to national security, foreign policy and proliferation concerns. And 127.1 outlines the consequences the penalties and the enforcement actions that I've spoken about today. And it covers both civil and criminal penalties for non-compliance with ITAR requirements. So um, that's my little uh, bite-sized chunks carried out today. Um, would anyone like to uh, ask any questions? I don't think that there is any questions. So everything was super clear, <laughs> Vincent. Oh, well, that's really nice to know. Um, thank you, Susanna. That, is there any other feedback from any? I thought you all disappeared and sent you to sleep or something. Um, no, th thank you so much, Susanna. You've been uh, an, a good participant. Anybody else got any any questions or feedback? Okay, brilliant. Um, let's have a look. Upcoming sessions coming up. We have on the 16th of November, Logistics for Traders importance, role and benefits. And don't forget, these are all good and free and all the rest of it. And 29th of November, the export import process. Um, and January 24th, uh, the new year, 
key IP, intellectual property considerations when going global. So register now, as it says on the bottom of the screen. Um, thank you so much for, for coming in. Um, we're five minutes early. Here's your chance. I have another little question if you've got any. Uh, my name's Vince Taylor. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thanks, bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye bye now. Have an enjoyable day, everybody. You too. And bye. you.